Um, so first question, kick off straight away, is just so that those listening can get to know who you are a little bit better. Could you tell us about your career kind of journey and how you've got to where you are and what it is you do now? So I do not play music, just to be totally clear with everybody on here. I was telling Charlie before we started broadcasting, I had a very short, uh, short time playing the flute, believe it or not, in my school band when I was 12 years old. But uh, I, my big thing when I was growing up was I was training for the Olympics in swimming. And I came in fourth in my swimming event when I was 16. And I was devastated because they only took the top three people. And I was just completely at ends as to what to do because that was kind of my whole path was to be a professional athlete. And what I, what I turned to instead was music. I'd always been really into music. My parents played a lot of music in the house. And what I started doing at 16 was putting on shows. And this is before you guys have a lot of health and safety things that regulations that we didn't have so much then. Um, but literally I would just like rent a hall or get a friend's garage or backyard and I put on gigs. And some of the bands like your parents you, out there might listen to such as uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Gwen Stefani, Rage Against the Machine, th those kind of bands. I was putting on those shows. And then when I went away to university, it was it was funny because I still wanted to work in the music business, but I had no idea. I was telling Charlie of how to get started in it. And nobody really knew. I remember going to the job center at my university and being like, I want to work in the music business. And they stared at me blankly. Uh, nobody really knew, knew how to help me. Um, but we'll get more into how I started out later on. I eventually ended up uh, working for Sony Music and my 21st birthday was spent on tour with Nirvana and uh, Pearl Jam. And by the time I was 25, I was head of marketing at Interscope Geffen a and working with people like Dr. Dre, Eminem, U2, Britney Spears, Backstreet Boys. I quit that to help Gwen Stefani start her fashion label, and then I quit that to work at Facebook. I quit that because one of my friends was sadly murdered not far away from where I was living at the time. I freaked out. I sold all my possessions, and I'd always wanted to live in England. So I came here and um, got a PhD, and I have been writing and presenting on TV ever since. So I now have three best-selling books. I've been in more than 50 documentaries and that kind of brings us to where we are now. Was that short? I was trying not to make it too long and boring. No, that's like a nice overview. We got some of your history. We got what you do now. Um, yeah, I liked it. That was good. Good, good length. Not too long, not too short. <laughs> okay. okay, good. Um, I get bored of my own voice. I'm like, oh, it's so boring. Rap, rap, rap. So thank you. Yeah. So we're going to move on to um, this question because I think it's like a nice, you just mentioned your book. So we're going to go ask a little bit more yes. about that now. Um, so obviously you've, you've written three books, um, did you say, about fan culture, which is such like a unique sort of topic to, to look at some different um you know, viewpoints of society. Um, what is it you find so interesting about kind of celebrity fan culture? And do you have any facts and tidbits that might surprise us, um, whether they're from your books or, or not? Well, that's a really good question, Charlie. I think I really got into fandom because really when I started think, looking at myself, I realized my earliest fandom was as silly as this may sound with Wonder Woman. I was obsessed with Wonder Woman when I was like three and four. I'm like, she's so awesome. And she really is, if you think about it, like she's totally um, this stunningly gorgeous woman. She takes anyone down. She can do anything. She's just like, you know, incredible fighter. Um, she doesn't age, like she's just, she's just great. So that was kind of, but really it was fandom. Like you're looking up to an entity. And I think that fandom, especially now, if we look at a, 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 
interesting fact is, if we look at how uh, churches in America, for example, every week 30 churches close. So we're looking at uh, Western religion, like Christianity. Some branches of Christianity will be extinct by the year 2030 at how rapid people are not attending because people, you know, the people that go to church are dying and no new people are um, starting to join traditional forms of religious worship. However, if we think about OnlyFans, if we think about uh, TikTok, those sort of fandom and like influencer culture, that has been completely normalized and that's all around fandom. So we're worshiping and looking for guidance in different ways. Like before it probably would have been through a more spiritual means. Now, even if you, if you even if it's subconscious, you're looking for what to do and how to lead your, lead your life through celebrities. And that's really, that was my entry point into looking at fandom. Yeah, really interesting. I've, I've never really thought about it before, but you do, particularly as a child, right? You fixate on, on whatever it is that you're really enjoying at the moment and that becomes like an obsession and that in itself is part of the fandom so and as you age you'll you'll find something new and different and enjoy them it's really interesting um never really thought about it before um as like yeah my last last book was on britney spears what i found really kind of unique about that fandom is there's people in their 30s some people in their 40s that like their whole life was dedicated this is when Britney was still in a conservatorship to getting Britney out of this legal, this legal thing she was in her conservatorship. And they really were so vested in someone that they knew they didn't know. They didn't, they, what they knew was from reading the tabloids and this, that, and the other. And it just, it just made me really realize and think about if we spent as much time trying to change things like, homelessness or animal welfare or any other number of uh, causes or issues that we have in, in, our, in our world that we spent fixated on celebrity and celebrity culture, just the, the power we would have for a better, a better life for so many people and creatures would be insane. But we don't. I'm just as, I'm just as guilty as everyone else, you know what I mean? So there is something there, like there is an intangible factor there as to why are we so fascinated by these, you know, these people. Yeah, really interesting. And so crazy that you've been able to kind of base your entire career around looking at these like different um you know icons and and what is their fandom culture like like just so crazy uh, which leads us on to our next question around kind of like passion um you know you come across as someone who's really passionate really invested and interested in both kind of like what you do and, and like the music industry in general so like how are you how do you kind of stay passionate and is that like very important to your career do you think Ooh, that's a really good question um, I would say I still get really, really excited about things because it's still meaningful to me and it is at the core of, of who I am and I'll never, ever be, I, I try not to be ungrateful for the things I get to do, if that makes any sense. So, you know, like a lot of the, the gang on this call, they may not know a lot of these people, but you know, just silly things like, oh my God, like I got to hang out with Andrew Ridgely from Wham! a couple weeks ago. And it's just things like that. I'm like, oh my God, like the, what I would say to anyone listening to this is keep a diary now, like a journal of your hopes and wishes, because I wish I would have done that so I could look back as an adult and be like, girl, you, you rocked it. Like you did it, you know? And I think the way that I just stay excited is just staying engaged in the world, you know, like trying to, I, I don't like saying dreams. Like people are like, my dream is to do this, that, and the other. I'm like, don't say dream, say goal. Because when you say goal with something, it makes it something you can be working towards. And that's a, that gets me really fired up to keep, like you said, have a passion for something, keep moving towards it. Um, because, you know, if you try to hit here, even if you don't get there, you may get to here. And that's really good. And that's, I think, what keeps me moving forward. That and um, because I live in the UK, like I'm so passionate about my hometown of Santa Cruz in California. And I think that kind of keeps me going because I want to figure out a way to be able to go between here and there. So I think it's good to have something or someone or someplace that is that kind of like ultimate thing. 
Um, but the real ultimate thing I think is just to be grateful of what every day that we were here. That's the real kind of thing that is the most important of everything. Yeah, I love that. I love that answer. And I also love the little tidbit in there that I'm going to pull out in case our students somehow missed it. Of the idea of like writing down now and keeping like a log of your hopes and dreams and how they, that changes throughout the years and oh. how you, what you achieve and what you don't. That's a really good like little piece of uh, advice for reflection, I think. Oh, Charlie, I wish I would have done that. I so There's so many things because do you know what I find myself doing? And this is going to be like a horror, a horrible idea, like horror, like, oh my Lord, I can't imagine that, is I find myself reaching out to people, because things that like only certain, and you're probably just old enough, Charlie, to know this, but like only certain people from certain moments of my life will understand how important something I'm doing now is, if that makes any sense. Like my husband, like he met me 13 years ago. He'll be like, oh, that's great, honey. But someone who knew me when I was like 16, and I'm doing something with an artist I loved when I was 16, they'll be like, oh, OMG, you know? So I'm like finding myself like reaching out to ex-boyfriends I had when I was like 14, being like, child, oh my God, guess what I, like, it's it, it's ridiculous, you know what I mean? Um, and they're just probably like, why is this freak of nature like emailing me out of nowhere? But <laughs> it's just because I just haven't, lo- like I just, I guess I just don't le- lose that wonder. And but it goes back to that fandom thing. like what music has meant to me is more than pretty much anything you know that's really nice it's a nice note to lead us on to our last question you're, oh. you're very good at linking these without even trying oh my God, I know what's coming going, next am i going too fast through our question no 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 it's great it's great we're doing good <laughs> can, I, can i say one non-music thing though that i wanted to um did i is this are we going to talk about the person the expected person is that what you're going to ask me? No, no. Our next question is around um, kind of cultural historians. Oh, OK. I wasn't going to, but I was. I wanted to say one thing. This is about following your hopes and dreams and people being this in, in general. Um, I just wanted to tell a story. It's not quite music related, but um, growing up in Santa Cruz, I'm not sure if you guys know Santa Cruz skateboards or like the Screaming Hand or Thrasher magazine. Do you know any of those, Charlie? I know very little about American culture, unfortunately. Oh, wow. That's probably best for everybody. But um, where, where I grew up, the guy that founded this the oldest skateboard brand in, um, in the world, he is from Santa Cruz, and he started it there. And kind of my dream, like, I didn't know him growing up because he was kind of like this legend that was, like, in town, but, like, nobody, like he was just untouchable. And I made it kind of my goal um, after I had like a, my first two best-selling books, I'm like, okay, the next project I want to do, I want it to be about Santa Cruz skateboards. And this guy that started the whole skateboard, like Tony Hawk was one of his, um, anyone who was skateboarding, Tony Hawk was like one of his people he mentored. So um, last time I went home, I like finagled gain a meeting with him. And I'm now like doing his, we're doing like a Netflix movie. We're doing his biography. We're doing a podcast. I'm staying at his house, which is like this, it's right next to Mark Zuckerberg's from Facebook, um, two acres on like the best surf break in Santa Cruz. And I guess the reason I'm saying that is even if it's something you think is so insane, someone's so untouchable, there's no way they'd ever talk to you. Like write that down as like your goal. Like I want to work with whoever it is and put that down because it just it, it if you you can work towards that you know and especially with someone like that that for me really informed like who I am because the whole kind of like ethos of, of Santa Cruz like res- just respecting nature and respecting people um, and kind of going for your goals that's a huge part of what Santa Cruz is about and this guy's a big part of it now I'm totally not linking the questions but um, Let's talk about the rock. Let's talk about the fit. Let's, let's go ahead. Go back to this. My atypical career. No, that was nice though. A nice little side, important to say, and I like it. And goes back to that sort of writing that stuff down. So, yeah, cool. Our next question then is, you know, you're one of the. There's not many people like you um, that have. Thank God. This, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Safety um, first, girlfriend. Safety first. 
there's not many people that have like, the same sort of like career as you and have like been through the same journey you have and you have like quite a specialism within the music industry you know there's not loads of you it's not like a a job title that many people have at all so how did you manage to carve out a place for you in this industry that's like so unique um and do you have any advice for any other young people that kind of want to do something that's a little bit unexpected and may maybe doesn't have like a, a name yet or a title but they, they have like a passion and a goal that they want to do that is such a good question and this is back to i'm sorry i'm such a nerd this is back to like writing things down so what i do you, you guys are gonna love this my husband made it up i'm not even kidding you we literally were like having some like wine one night and he's just we're just i'm just like oh what do we really like call this like writer is so snore like that's so boring and um like i've done so many things at this point. like i don't know anyone else i literally even now like this is probably like 15 13 years ago i'm like i don't know anyone else that's like worked with all these artists then worked at the internet company worked at a fashion label like I just don't know anyone else and my husband like you know lubricated with with wine was like you're a rock and roll cultural historian Whee! that was literally so the moral of that story is you can make up your own thing you can just you can say this is kind of what I want to be in the world and then I'm going to make it I'm going to make it be so and, and what's fascinating is that I've said that and people call me like I'm on the BBC all the time. I'm in all these documentaries talking about it. Yes, I do have all this knowledge, but it's like, how do I take that knowledge and what I'm interested in and make it so people understand a title that people understand what it is? Uh, and I was telling you, Charlie, before we got on that in going back to how I first began, when I first began, I was living in Santa Cruz and there was no music industry at all. There was no like, this is what you do. There was no internet. So I'm like, what do I like to do? I like to, uh, to go to shows. And so I literally started just putting on shows, charging friends $2 um, and getting bands I like to come and play. That was like, that was my business plan. Nobody told me what to do. And then when I got to university, Again, like the there's this whole idea that you have to go to university to work in the music business. That is a bunch of cobblers. That's not true at all. What you need to be doing is you creating your own pathway. So what are the things that are interesting to you? I was saying to, to Charlie what I did because there was no music business school, schools. I literally got a notebook and I sat down. I'm like, okay, what are all the things I like to do that are music related? I like to read about music um, music concerts. I like to go to concerts. I like to read reviews of albums. I like to listen to the radio. This is of course in the 90s, so before any of y'all were born. Um, I watch MTV, which doesn't even really exist anymore. So I just, I wrote down every single thing from like the most tangible, AKA something that was happening right there in front of me, AKA my school newspaper, to something that seemed insane working for MTV in Manhattan. I mean, I hadn't even left a two hour radius of where I'd lived at that point. And I was thinking of Manhattan. It was like I was saying, I'm gonna go live on Mars. But that, um, like six months later, where was I interning? I was interning at MTV. So, and that was from nobody helping me. It was just from me literally. And this is something else. Ask your parents, you guys. Like, did Charlie, did you guys have phone books here? Do you remember that? Or was that before you, you were alive? Um, I think they were dying out when I was a child, but when I was a kid, we definitely, we definitely had phone books. So yeah, so in America, we had phone books. We also had this thing called 411, which is like the directory. So you'd get charged like a dollar every time you'd call to get a number from 411. And if you were calling a different state, you'd get completely screwed. They charge you $5 to get a number. So just imagine I'm like this little college kid. I have no money. I'm like living on Super Noodle. And I was like, do, 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 like, you know, like, you know, 411 New York City. Hello, MTV. Like, I didn't know what I was doing. Like, I was completely clueless. But you know what? I had nothing to lose. And that's it. Having the tenacity, you have nothing to lose but, but to go for it. And just have that tenacity. And be willing. That's the other thing. It's like, 
be willing to do anything. I mean, even now, like I'll say, I'll, if, if it's something I want to do, I'll be like, I will pick up digital dog poo for you. If that will help you like always show that you're valuable to that person, you know? Um, sorry. I'm just ranting at this point, Charlie. No, I like it. It's that sort of thing of like, the worst thing that can happen is is no and if you have that drive to do it then then take that risk because you know no one else can carve your own path within this industry which can be quite difficult so exactly you know what there was this it's so it's oh so american but there was this um thing going around a couple probably it's probably a decade ago now but it was like 100 rejection letters this is so american and it was like i want to get 100 rejection letters and the idea was that this person was going to like apply for a hundred different things that they wanted to do. But the thing is like, if you apply, someone is going to say yes. That's the whole thing. Like right now I'm um, doing interviews for a new book and I'm in I mean, I'm asking for interviews for like huge celebrities. And like, I think on Monday I emailed 25 people. I've had six people say yes. So, you know, I think 15 have not answered. Some have said no, but six have said yes. That's a pretty, and these are people I don't even know. They're like, yeah. So it's like, why not? You know, put yourself out there. You have nothing to lose. Yeah, nice. Like it. So um, our next question is a little bit different um, uh -oh. again, but I'm sorry if you could hear thumping. I think my neighbor just, just started having some building done. I'm hoping that's not coming through. <laughs> um, our next question is still like thinking about the music industry and you know you're currently writing a book you've already done three why is it important that we document kind of cultural icons yes, um how much of an impact do they have on our society both like in the moment and then also like looking back historically Ooh, that's such a good question um, I think it's so, so important because, especially because um, a lot of the people that I write about are women that have been not written about either, uh, they've not been captured in a way that is true, or they've not been talked about at all. So even, it was funny with Britney Spears, for example, that was a really weird one because there's been so much written about her, but then at the same time, it's all been written in like one vein, like looking at her as this sexualized, crazy woman without looking at anything else that's happening. So we're living in a, to me, a very scary time in terms of um, possible censorship, in terms of being scared to talk and write and commentate. So it's more important than ever to be writing these things down so we don't end up in a Handmaid's Tale kind of situation. I mean, we're already going towards George Orwell, 1984. So to write this stuff down is imperative. Yeah, I think it can be easy sometimes to forget about history. You know, if we don't, if we don't document it, we'd never know what happens. Absolutely, and, and Charlie, it's, it's fascinating because I'm working with this one band um, from the 80s. They were the first all-female band to play their own instruments and have um, two number one songs on the charts. And I'll be sitting there like in the British Library and I will get so, I could say a string of swear words right now, so angry. These are things that are being written in the last like 20 years about them. Like, and it's just like, are you kidding me? Like, how can the people are questioning can they, are this them actually playing their instruments is it them actually writing their songs look at their breasts it's just and that's and with Brittany it was kind of the same thing I mean she obviously doesn't play her own music but um it was you just will not see the way that men and women are spoken about it's just you don't see a similar it's not parallel at all um and it kind of creates this cycle where women are well okay you're not going to take me seriously as an artist or writer or anything else so i may as well use my sexuality so it's this kind of it is this never-ending mirror and loop that's very difficult to get out of and i think also something that is not really spoken of openly and honestly in a lot of ways and also to see other women ganging up on women that to me is really appalling but um we can go on and on about that that's another talk sis yeah, it definitely, definitely hurts to see that when you see that. But it's great that you kind of go into it with that mindset as like a fresh look to actually, you know, 
find and be as honest and truthful about um, these sort of topics as you can. And you know what's cool though is like I'm, I've been working with a lot of younger artists that are coming up um, and it's exciting like people like Arlo Parks or um, Gurley or Billie Eilish, people like that that I've, I've met and spent time with. They, in one way, they aren't saddled with as much of it as I think like my generation was, but in some ways, so in some ways I think they're able to talk about it more freely, but then I still see them struggling. Like when, like when Billy was on the cover, I think it was a Vogue. She was on the cover in a sexy outfit. People were like, what is going on? She has this corset on, how dare she? So there's a lot of work to be done and a lot of conversation to still be had. Yeah, definitely. Um, great. So that kind of uh, we've got one more question left before we move on oh. to our student Q and A. Um, so if any questions do need to be come in, now's your time. Please do start start submitting them. But for a final question, a uh, little bit of okay. like a topic change, um, we'd love for you to do a little bit of name dropping and tell Ooh. us about a time where you kind of met a celebrity uh, and kind of what were they like to meet them in person. Well, I meet a lot of celebrities, a lot, a lot of celebrities. And um, the one thing you have to remember about celebrities is most of them were normal people at one time. <laughs> so the more normal you treat them, the better the experience is going to be. Um, and I'm probably quite jaded in that way. Like I don't really get I, the people I get excited about are but then again, like people I get excited about are people from like when I was younger. So I think it's kind of like when you are probably like 13 to probably like 20. And that's like the main time when you find people that you're like, I love you. So even when I meet those people for me from that time period, I get really excited. But it quickly wears off. Like for me, like there's a couple people I'm working with now that I loved them when I was that age. And I don't like I'm working with them now and I'm like, I still get a little excited, but not really. Um, I was telling you recently, I did some, I had, I, okay, you'll love this story, Charlie. So um, one of my friends, he is Harry Styles' publicist. And um, he called me and he said, oh, what are you doing in a week? Um, I have this dinner I have to go to. And I'm like, oh, like, I don't really feel like going out, man. And he's just like, oh, come on, Jen. I'm not seeing you in like, you know, a couple months. And I'm like, okay. And he's like, it's, um, it's like casual black tie. And I'm like, what does that mean? Okay. Like, what? okay. He didn't tell me anything else. And like the day of the part that the event was like a dinner. I'm like, Oh, I think I have diarrhea. I don't think I feel good. like I was like, you know, you're just like, I don't want to, I think I have diarrhea. I think I have a fever. I think I <laughs> like, I was like, do you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and he, I like texted him. I'm like, and I'm like, Oh, I don't think I feel. He's like, no, you're going. Okay, so I wear, you're going to love this, I'm like casual black, this is like at the time of COVID, it was like right when COVID was ending, so I'm like, what do I have, like, like what do I have, I find this in my closet, I find, I kid you not, a sequin dress, rainbow sequins, I bought from Sainsbury's, so I wear this rainbow sequins dress, um, and high top, high top Nikes, that's what I wear to this event, okay, I get there, it's, 15 people, everybody's dressed entirely in black. I'm in a rainbow sequin dress from Sainsbury's. It's Dave, it's Stormzy, um, who else is that? It's just, it's like the glitterati of pop and grime, dot, 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 and me and my friend. There's like 15 of us having dinner at this. And it was absolutely hilarious because they put some stuff online of like, uh, it was like Stormzy and Dave playing at the piano. And one of my friends, one of my um, friends, he heard my, like it was just, it was just of Dave and Stormzy, but he heard my voice in the background. Cause these, like most people would be like, oh my God, it's Dave and Stormzy playing together. And they'd be like focused on that. Not me. I'm like gabbing away. Like, oh yeah. Like you could hear my voice in the background, but that was really fun because, uh, first of all, Storms, what I didn't expect is Stormzy is extremely tall. He's super, super, like I'm six feet tall. He's way taller than me. And um, he smells really good. And I was just like, oh, child. 
I was like that scary kind of like cougar that he's that um, he's probably like get away from me as quickly as possible. But no, he was. Um, you can see why he is a good celebrity, and what I mean by that is very, very smart, very, very funny, but also just can't work a room and talk to anybody, and very normal. Great. Was that enough of like how he was? I, I love the idea of everyone in black and you just being there in like rainbows, Rainbow standing out in a crowd of celebrities. <laughs> and then like a normal person would just be like, yeah, here's me in my sequins dress, not me. I'm like, this dress is from Sainsbury's. <laughs> Such a love break. It. Love it. So that is like the end of the formal oh. interview questions. We will now move on to our submitted questions and there'll be a mix of pre-submitted and uh, live submitted. So we'll start with this question, um, right. which comes from uh, the John Henry Newman School. Uh, and they've asked several questions around okay. um, like music careers. Um, so this first question is, um, what universities are best for a music career? Ooh, I would say, um, if you, why are you going to university? That would be my question for you. Like, why are you going to university? Because I know that may sound strange, but um, you are going to, unless your parents are paying for it, you're going to get into a load of student loan debt and um like why why so in turn i would say if you're going to university if you go for something you absolutely love and you probably be better suited to go and go to a wrestle group school there's so many of these schools if you if you're just like i want to go to university i want to go to university go to a wrestle group school and maybe do history of music or something like that and then there's so many different organizations now like the one i work for an organization um called moving the needle which is all about education and mentoring young people to help them work in the music industry and there's lots of organizations like this. I just work for one, like I said, moving the needle. Um, that we don't charge people anything. We like want to hook people up with mentors so that, especially young people, uh, to help them see all the different opportunities outside of being a singer um, that there are, whether it's a producer, working at a label, being a tour manager, and we don't charge people anything for that. So, my advice to someone saying do, the university route, why are you going to university? Do your parents want you to go to university? Do you want to go to university? Um, a lot of these music business schools, in my opinion, are um, they pad stuff out for the three years so that you're paying the nine grand in their tuition for that amount. Yeah, I guess that it's too, that that sort of. No, 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 that's that can be, you know, as, as truthful it is if, if you feel like in your experience, it, it depends on what you want. I love that of thinking of music history, if you want to go down that route and trying to think about all the people that are taking music courses and if there's like a different sort of course that you could do that will help you get in a different sort of way. Do you know what? And I think that you really hit on something there because I think if you're thinking music business, that's so specific. Like one of the things that I find a lot of, because I have, I have taught at these schools, and one thing that a lot of young people don't have a grip on is the overall context of where the music they're listening to, wh where that came from, or what came before it, or the family tree, um, or the culture around it. And all those things are so important if you're going to be, uh, not just if you're a musician yourself, but if you're going to be talking to anybody, like if you're gonna be talking with a label, or you're gonna be talking and like, trying to get branding or sponsorship, you have to understand like, who was Andy Warhol? Who was Tupac? You have to kind of, um, these basic, and that's just from like the last 50 years, um, an understanding of what came before and how things are connected. That's almost more important than understanding the, the business itself. And a lot of these music business courses I found, the people are reading, are they, they're learning it from a book instead of actually being in it. That's why the kind of mentorship things like moving the needle are great. It's people that are actively working in the business now. I have popped the moving the needle uh, in the chat if anyone or in the announcements, just in case anyone wants to go and check that out, you can do. Um, our next question has been submitted anonymously and it's oh, 
Uh, it's <laughs> it's what job were you doing when you worked with Dr. Dre and Eminem? I was the head of marketing at Interscope Geffen A and M. And what did you do there? Was it just like marketing their albums or music? Oh, or? Yeah, so we would do um, like a new record would be coming out, and you would put together the marketing plan for what you're going to do. We specifically worked. This is like, this is like right. Uh, this is like the late '90s, early 2000s. So this is right when the inter the interweb was starting to happen. So my job in particular was to be working with record terrestrial bricks and mortar record stores at what we were going to do in terms of campaigns and say and sales and visibility at those record stores to let people know that the albums were out what advertising we were going to run um where were they going to do like a big thing we were really into was doing meet and greets which would be now people charge for them but this is like like 20 years ago that was a big thing we at a record label would do to kind of get people when i say people i mean like the vips excited was to you can you know if you put these records up by the cash wrap you can come and you know as an exchange exchange for that you can come and meet dr dre so th there's a lot of that but you're doing it on a, on a nation nationwide level i also did a lot of touring like i would be on the road with the bands a lot to make sure they got to uh, they're different, um, like they did a lot of, uh, what do you call it, uh, in-store appearances and performances to make sure that they did, to make sure they got to those uh, on time and to also make sure that they did, they did meet all those VIPs that could help them in their careers. That was a big part of my job. So a lot of time on the tour bus, a lot of time with bands. A lot of time, um, it was it was it it was just a lot of time like interacting with a lot of different characters, as you can probably imagine. Yeah, nice. Thank you for answering that one. Um, our next question um, is: the music has a bad rep. Sorry, the music industry has a bad rep of being unstable. Do you think that's true? I don't know what they mean by unstable. Um, I, I think, I think most, I mean as a career, so um, like it's not like the most stable career to have. No. Yeah, I don't. I don't think that's true. I think I don't know where they're getting that information from. I think pretty much all industries are. I don't. I don't know what industry is stable per se anymore. Um, and I don't. I think the most important thing is you only live one life. So what are you passionate and excited about, and what's going to make you go? Yes, I get to go do this in the morning. Like there's not a Monday that comes, and I'm like. Oh, Lord, help me. Like, I'm always like, yes, I get to go do this. That's the most important thing. I like that. I like that as an answer. Um, you know, don't consider it unstable if it's your passion, right? That's that's all you want to do. Don't live in fear. Like, why yeah. live in fear like that? That's not, that's not a great, good way to live. That's a horrible way to live. Especially if you're, like, 16 years old. My goodness. <laughs> Too true, too true, sure. <laughs> um, all right, our next question comes from Tally Grammar School and they've asked, how do you look for opportunities to help you become more immersed in pop culture? Ooh, that's a good, did my husband send that one in? My husband was just watching the Brits the other night. I, I was, it's funny, I get invited to go to the Brits every year and I never go. So I'm just like, I just don't care, which I know is really bad. I'm like, because to me it's work, you know what I mean? Um, I would say I don't really look for, I don't look for opportunities to be immersed in popular culture. That's the truth of it. I, um, I'm not one of those people that's like, I have to be relevant because I'm not, I'm not going to be relevant to a 16 year old in terms of, you know, like I might meet Sam Smith or have dinner with Harry Styles, but those people are, you know, 30 years younger than me. So we can talk and have fun, but um, their music is not necessarily for me, if that makes any sense. So my answer to that question is, I always am looking for opportunities to meet interesting people and see how we can collaborate on things that are fun and meaningful for both of us. But I don't try to insert myself in situations or be like, I'm cool and funky. Like, I'm not like, bless her, I'm not like Madonna that's like, I'm 20 years old. It's like, oh sis, you ain't, okay? Do you know what I'm talking awesome. about, Charlie? Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
Um, so we have time just for like maybe like one more question or so, and then we'll come to you for any final kind of like thoughts that you'd like to leave the young people with today. So um, how about this one? This is quite a nice one. Um, really simply, who is your favorite artist? Ooh, who is my favorite artist? That's a really good question. Uh, I don't have one, I would say, because it's changed over time. My all time favorite band is a band called The Smiths. This is actually this is actually a good this good one for the the kids to hear. So my all time favorite band is a band called The Smiths. And guess whose um, biography autobiography I'm working on? The drummer from The Smiths right now. Crazy. That's, when I was that's 13, crazy. I had, yeah, when I, when I was thirteen, I had a poster of The Smiths on my wall. It's like completely insane. Yeah, to now be like working on that that person's biography and looking at their life. Yeah, I have this Crazy. other project I'm doing that's completely insane. That um, it's the this woman. Her name is Liana Walanda. Try saying that five times fast. And she's a seventh generation tightrope walker in America. So in America, they're like this. This there's this. They're called the Flying Walandas. They're like really well known in America. But she fell from a seven. They do all their tightrope walking. Their tightrope walking family, um, as one is Charlie. They and um, she, they do all their tightrope walking without nets, and she fell seven stories, broke every bone in her face, right? Came back and crossed with her brother Times Square in New York on a, t on a high wire. So I'm working with her on her book, but it's the most. This is like a final thought to the to the everybody on here. It's completely crazy, you guys, because. She will just be talking to me and she'll be like, oh, I didn't want to go to this party this weekend because I felt fat. I'm like, you crossed Times Square on a high wire. You you do these crazy, you're, you're walk, like you're, you're walking on a, a high wire that's the size of a, 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 a you know, a 50, a 50 pence piece. And um, and thinking and you're telling me you're worried about going to like seeing it like last night she texted me she's like oh I saw my ex boyfriend Ugh. I'm just like it's just so crazy so it's like no matter who you are you can be doing one thing that's so out there and like so brave like we're walk literally walking a high wire and still have these doubts about yourself but don't let them hold you back you know like she broke every bone in her face and she still got back up on that high wire and went across Times Square in New York. That's the best way to leave life. Don't be worried about saying this unstable. Just live as fearlessly as you can. And when you get scared, think what's the worst that can happen? I think that's a really awesome note to kind of finish this broadcast on. Um, thinking about that kind of way to live, way to move forward, particularly as, um, you know, our young people have so much life ahead of them and so many opportunities um, are really great. Do you have anything else you would like to say before we end today's session? Wear sunscreen on your face and hands and neck. <laughs> and uh, also one last thing, this is an important one. On your social media, pretend your nan is going to be looking at your social media or even your great grandma because some of that stuff can haunt you, you guys, forever. So just something that might be funny to your friends to put up there, just make sure your digital, oh, this is a serious note, make sure your digital footprint is pretty clean. Sorry to be serious, Charlie, not to end it on a... It's all right. It's only going to get more important. <laughs> It's only going to be more important, like the more the further technology goes. So, um, yeah, sounds great. Well, thank you for for joining us today. It's been really great to have you on uh, and to get to to interview. It's been a pleasure. You are an absolute legend, and thank you so much. And th please have me again. We definitely will. All right. Well, thank lots so of love, much. and everybody out there. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. <laughs>